Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today at the second session of the Commonwealth Community Symposium. I'm Catherine Burgess, the Vice, Bur Vice President of Land Use and Development at Smart Growth America. This symposium is hosted by Smart Growth America and Locus in partnership with the Barr Foundation. Before we begin, I'd like to extend a special thank you to Barr for supporting this symposium and a related program of work. Today's event is designed, is designed as a series of five addressing key issues of interest to local government staff and elected officials in Massachusetts. Our topics have included small business support, which is what we'll be covering today, and walkability, which is an available as a recorded session from two weeks ago. Future sessions will address TOD, embedding equity into the municipal budgeting process, and a new additional session on zoning, which will feature a new research report produced by our form. Smart Growth is a national nonprofit dedicated to advancing sustainable and equitable development. We envision a country in which no matter who you are or where you live, you can enjoy living in a neighborhood which is healthy, prosperous, and resilient. Land use and development are key to achieving this mission and to addressing many of the most pressing challenges of our time, including climate change, racial equity, and public health. This event is also hosted in partnership with Locus, which is SGA's coalition of real estate developers and invested committed to triple bottom line outcomes who advocate for policies supporting equitable, sustainable, and walkable development. And with that, I'd like to introduce our president of Locus, Massachusetts, Doug Landry, who is instrumental in putting together this symposium. Since 2018, Doug has been the president of Locus, Massachusetts, and is a longtime member of our steering committee. Thank you very much, Doug, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and I do want to extend one more time a welcome to Catherine. Uh, she has joined uh, Smart Growth America as the uh, Vice President for Land Use and Development a couple of months ago, I think now. So uh, welcome again, Catherine. Um, and thanks, everybody, uh, again, for, for joining this. Some of, some of the folks on the call today uh, were part of the first session held a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it was just a terrific, terrific uh, session. And I hope that everybody can take advantage of viewing the recording, if you missed it, uh, it was really great. Uh, it was all about walkability and, and how some strategies can be employed uh, in downtowns. Um, this particular session here, again, following on this theme of emergent strategies from, from the pandemic and how we sort of are coming out of this, uh, this crisis together. And as I said in the in opening remarks last time, Massachusetts is particularly better position than, than many places in the country to uh, take advantage of the lessons learned over the past two years. And in particular, this, this session here, you know, small business ecosystems um, kind of resonates with me uh, strongly because, you know, small businesses are the foundation uh, of our economy. And in Massachusetts in particular, if we talk about downtown strategies, we talked about walkability, and we talk about downtown revitalization strategies as a competitive issue in the, in the national and global economy, particularly with life sciences in, in this region and the attractiveness of the workforce and quality of life here uh, that companies, biopharma companies, life sciences companies look for in terms of site selection uh, for you know uh, continuing that that element of our economy. So you know we have a broad um, group of people on this call. Again, all corners of the state: Greenfield, North Adams, Boston. We have a lot of other folks on the, on this call from around the country too. So it's there. You know, I'm I'm very happy that they're going to be listening in and hearing some of the things that uh, you know Massachusetts is experiencing and in, in best practices. Uh, so I'm very excited by by this. Um, um, particular session and uh, let's get started uh, and I'll, we'll do an introduction of each of the speakers there are, there are, are three speakers and a moderator uh, for this one and the first one uh, is is Bobby Boone uh, and Bobby if you can come on camera here uh, Bobby is the founder and chief strategist of an access um, a very interesting uh, background Bobby um, uh, Detroit's near to my heart I went to school out there in, in Ann Arbor and uh, I'm going back there this weekend for the game. So uh, some of the lessons that uh, you know you learned from Detroit, uh, you know I'm familiar with that city, the Woodbridge neighborhood, et cetera. It's just a fascinating place, and I can't wait to hear your your uh, thoughts on this. So Bobby, what's your definition of a small business? 
All right, Doug, thanks for the intro. Um, so I would say a small business is really um, one that's rooted in community. Um, the focus of And Access really is thinking about ways for retail to reach people. Um, and when I say retail, I always think about retailers such as clothing shops and different boutiques, but also you know, food and beverage. So restaurants, uh, bars, uh, coffee, coffee shops, cafes, et cetera. And then I think about neighborhood services, um, you know, the things that you need in your kind of day-to-day -day life to get around these are print shops and florists and other um, barber shops and salons that you know really are integrated within community and why i resonate with them as small businesses is because those are the businesses you know that we see the most um, those are the businesses that have really um, defined community identities those are the businesses that are often representative of those community identities so you know you think about um you know chinatowns across the world that have been um, tenanted by you know various chinese owned and operated businesses um, whereas you see you know the same kind of instance occur you know in, in many other community typologies you know and really you know thinking about you know underserved communities where you know many national brands are are not looking because they you know they're different formulas cannot just make it work and so you know thinking about that these small businesses have come and backfilled and really, you know, ensure that the communities are able to, you know, achieve and um, obtain the goods and services that are needed day in, day out. All right. Thank you for that, Bobby. Looking forward to your, your remarks. Next up is Tina Leone. Uh, Tina is the founder of the Ballston Business uh, Improvement District. Uh, down in Alexandria, Virginia. And uh, I'm always amazed at how how embedded the BID system is down in, in DC and in Northern Virginia, something that I think Massachusetts can learn some lessons from. We've dabbled in it a little bit, uh, <clears throat> but uh, not not nearly to the, to the the degree that the the DC and Northern Virginia area has. So um, it's an award-winning uh, BID, and uh, Tina's gonna give us her definition of a small business. Thank you, Doug. Um, again, Tina Leone, CEO of the Boston Bid. We're actually in Arlington, Virginia. Um, we're one of three bids that make up Arlington. Um, yes, for small businesses, very similar definition to that of Bobby's. Uh, you know, they're basically we we look at them more as a storefront retail. Um, our restaurants, our services, um, which we have so many in Boston in our small, very urbanized district. Um, I would also include them in that our um, co-working space tenants as well. Usually they're startups or they're just very small businesses that uh, need a little bit of space and a lot of flexibility. Um, so that's, I would I would wanna include them in that group as well. Um, again, very extremely vital, and I know we're gonna talk about placemaking, but they're extremely vital to creating uh, the sense of place that where people actually want to live, work, play, and learn. Thanks, Tina. And certainly, yeah, uh, Northern Virginia, again, DC, that's that's in action. Good uh, good lessons to be learned down there. Uh, next up, Ilana Pruess, um from Recast City. She is the founder and chief executive officer uh, of Recast City and author of a book called Recast Your City, How to Save Your Downtown with Small Scale Manufacturing. And again, uh, resonates with me, Alana. Um, I'm from a small town in Northern Mass, uh, Athol, uh, out by the Greenfield area. Uh, you know, mill towns in that whole region that uh, you know were hit pretty bad in the early '80s with you know the global economy. And so, how those kinds of places, the North Adams of the world, the the, the Greenfields of the world, can come back with some small-scale manufacturing strategies? I'm I'm really interested to hear uh, you know your your remarks and also your definition of a small business. Thank you, Doug. I'm, I'm really happy to be here today. So small businesses to me, I mean, if we look at the federal definition, it's any business under 500 employees, which to me is gigantic. So I really look at folks that do fit into the fabric of our neighborhoods, um, like the previous or my fellow panelists are saying, um, you know, generally when I look at businesses, they're going to max out at about 50 employees, unless there's some existing uh, buildings that that are really making a big difference for that. Um, Doug referred to my focus on small scale manufacturing and, and out of the whole bucket of, of small business, you know, small businesses can be in office spaces, they can be in storefronts, 
Um, they can be in industrial areas. They're sort of location agnostic from my perspective. Um, but when we look at small scale manufacturing, these are businesses that are making some kind of tangible good that you can replicate or package. Um, hot sauce handbags or hardware, right? It's it's low tech to high tech and everything in between. Um, it's the prototypers who are creating that new gadget um, that's gonna be the next big wave. And it's also the food producers that's creating the, the cool hot sauce. And one of the things that I love about this sector is that they're both able to sell in person, but also online and also wholesale. And so thinking about how we are investing in small businesses that really can be nimble in the face of disaster economic disaster, environmental disaster, um, you know, I think is a is a, an important piece to be thinking about um, and really thinking about the diversity of business ownership so that when we are thinking about who gets the storefronts, um, who gets different space on our, our local main street uh, or in our historic downtowns like Doug was referring to in our old mill towns, that it reflects the demographic diversity of our community and that there's a public good to support this diversity of business owners within our work. Thanks, Alana. And so, so uh, to take us through the rest of this session, Calvin Gladney, Calvin, come on, come on camera. Um, <laughs> good to see you, my friend, and can't wait to get back down to DC uh, and, and hang out like we usually do on our stairs committee meetings. I cannot wait for that. Hopefully that's sometime soon. But Calvin uh, is our CEO, uh, president and CEO of Smart Growth America uh, since since 2018. It's uh, it's time flies when you're having fun for sure that it, it, uh, it doesn't seem that long but uh, you've made a mark and have done a lot of great things here with smart growth america calvin and uh everybody on this call is going to be in very good hands going through the rest of this session i'll hand it over to you thanks a lot doug um wanted to say two things before i bring in the illustrious panel um one is one thing that is not mentioned often on why i care about these issues is I actually ran a small business for a number of years. As a matter of fact, it's where and when I met Alana and Bobby back in the day. So I really do appreciate what it actually takes to run a small business. And often the folks who are um, making the decisions in, in creating the policies that relate to supporting um, small businesses may have not actually been involved in doing that kind of work. So. Um, try to bring that to the table. The other thing I wanted to say is why um, small businesses are important to a smart growth um, approach. And it really comes down to thinking about what you actually um, picture and want to feel when you're in an environment that is leveraged to tactics and principles and smart growth. So you think about you want a neighborhood, you want a town, you want a corridor that have a mix of uses. You want to have a mix of people of different incomes and um, wealth, and you want to have that vibrancy and authenticity that you you know it when you see it and you feel it. Um, when you go to a place where there's a Walmart, Target, and a CVS versus a Wally's wine shop um, and other um, small businesses, you know the difference. And so we want to implement smart growth tactics in these places to create that type of environment and you have to have vibrant, successful, and supported small businesses to actually accomplish that goal. Um, and so that's why we care both myself personally, but also from why Smart Growth America actually dives into small business commercial corridors and making this work. Um, wanted to bring my three panelists um, onto the screen here because we're gonna, we're gonna actually dive into these issues um, and first, uh, I'm going to pose a question to each of them. We're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about, again, thinking about this ecosystem. We're going to talk about the economics of small business. We're going to talk about placemaking. And we're going to talk about equity. Um, and so I'm going to put a question to each of, each of my panelists and let them run um, with those questions. So first, I'll start with you, Alana. Good to see you virtually. I uh, hope to see you in person soon. I um, wanted to talk about economics and often small businesses are not talked about in the broad value proposition they bring to the larger regional um, economy. So can you talk to us a little bit about how small businesses play into the regional economy? 
where they fit into that dynamic um, and you know essentially their role. Thank you, Calvin. Uh, always happy to be here with you, and especially when I remember to turn off mute. Um, there's a couple of different ways it factors in, and um, I think it's important to think about them from a couple of different from these couple of different ways. One is that um, historically, economic development training was all about poaching. It was about finding the big game, stealing it from somewhere else, giving them enough incentive money to come um, and um, Research shows that 70% of those businesses were going to go there anyway. Um, most of the time, the economic impact is not big enough to pay for the discounts or the incentives that they provided at the beginning. Um, and on top of that, most places don't win that game. Um, so if we sort of put that aside and say, sure, a couple places can play that game, but it isn't actually beneficial to you anyway if you're putting a lot of monetary incentives into it, then we have to look at locally owned businesses. Um, the benefit is is sort of multifold, right? By supporting locally owned businesses, we're helping members of our community build wealth. If we're doing that in a way that is inclusive, we're helping people from all the different demographics of our community build wealth. Um, but on top of that, um, by supporting the businesses in our community, we're actually showing other people that we are a good place to own a business. So other people in our community become entrepreneurs and we attract entrepreneurs from other communities to want to come and put down roots and invest and build there. So there's all of those benefits in economic development. And the other part of it or another part of it is to think about what kinds of jobs we want to create. A lot of our economic development decision making just says jobs, any kind of job is a good thing. And the reality is, is what we've seen is we are now have the, and I'll talk about this a little bit later on, but we have the greatest income inequity in our country we've ever had, and that was before the pandemic. And that, I think, is mostly because we've said we prize high income jobs, and oh, we have these indirect benefits that create these other jobs. And the reality is, is that we have these indirect benefits that create these other jobs, they're predominantly low wage jobs. And so we are providing incentives that are increasing that gap instead of saying, we need more middle income jobs in our community and let's invest in businesses that help create those, those middle income jobs. And then the last point I will make is that the places that do invest in their small businesses that do fill their storefronts with these locally owned businesses are these unique places that people want to be, which is the one of the best ways actually to attract other businesses to your community because they want to be in a place with a thriving downtown, with a thriving main street. Um, with a with a group of people that have uh, the experience that might they might want to hire into the businesses that they're creating. So each of those factors to me speaks towards this investment in small business. Perfect. Thank you, Alana. Um, one of the sort of rip off of something you just said, which is unique places people want to be, and ask a question to Tina. Um, we can think of small businesses as just a function of providing a service, um, but we can also think about small businesses, and this I think is what Alana alluded to, as another function of placemaking. And if you're a city official, elected official, or someone working in city government and thinking about supporting small businesses, another reason you could do that is as a tool for placemaking for communities and for neighborhoods. Can you just share your experience? Yeah that and your thoughts on how small businesses do that? Yes, thank you. Um, small business is absolutely vital to placemaking, to successful placemaking. Uh, you can create, you can fabricate a wonderful, beautiful place, but if you do not have the amenities there uh, to make it a worthwhile place to live, work, play, learn, experience, it's people are not going to want to be there and then so small businesses uh play an extremely vital role um you, they are necessary because you don't want people to have to walk you know they they don't want to walk to everything they want to have everything you know within usually ideally 300 feet <laughs> but uh you know a couple of blocks you know for everything that you want or need all of your you know, whether it's your restaurants and uh, you know we're fortunate uh we've grown you know our district into we have almost 80 restaurants within a five block radius um you know your dry clean your coffee your shoe repair your daycare your 
gyms. I mean, uh, you know, all of this needs to be accessible. Now, that being said, people still want access to cars or to, you know, your zip car or your metro. And they say you have to have transportation needs um, just because it's, it needs to be there. But the businesses are what create, you know, that lifestyle, that that uh, that desirable lifestyle where I can walk out my door and get whatever I need, go and do whatever I want. And also that being said, you need a good, it needs to be walkable. So, I mean, if we're in Boston here, we're very fortunate. We have a walk score of 94. So it's very easy for people to get about. It's flat, the sidewalks are, are large um, and you know they can, they can access all of these, these great amenities. Um, I think that you know, also the, the, the small businesses will, will you know, it just keeps feeding upon itself as, as uh, Ilana alluded to that you know, the, when you have a cluster it, uh, of, of great small businesses and you're supporting them, it attracts more. Um, and that's exactly what's happened in my district. Uh, we have a, a, all during COVID, my district was never dead. I mean, and not, not to dis, you know, not to dis downtown DC, but it was pretty quiet down there. Uh, and Boston was never dead. People were out, they were wearing their masks, they were social distancing, but they were out and about. Um, they were still able to pick up their food. They were still able to do their dry cleaning. They were, they were there. Um, so it's, it's really goes to the vibrancy and creating the vitality you know, of, of a district and small businesses are just critical to that. I want to push you on one thing. This will be a little bit of moderator's privilege, but um, <laughs> um, one thing that city officials are faced with is, is, is navigating the politics of a point I'll make, which is not all small businesses are created equal when it comes to their placemaking value. Can you just share your mm. experience on how for example, a small insurance office is a small business, but it may not benefit you from a placemaking standpoint and kind of give, give city folks your experience in terms of how you might think about certain small businesses being more beneficial to placemaking than others. Um, I, I would push back on that only because you can't have retail everywhere, right? I mean, it's, it doesn't, it's, we, we've learned this in Arlington that you know, all the first floors became all retail and it, it failed, you know, it's, it's not, it doesn't work. So we, you know, we, of course we want, we want our, we want our property owners to be successful and an insurance company or a bank, we got lots of banks. I can't believe how many banks we have, but it does, it's, there are ways to activate that space. And for example, I just met with one of our banks and they are excited about, they want to become more involved in the community. They want, they want the community to know that they're there, that they are an option, that they do you know, a lot of commercial banking, blah, blah, blah. And so we're engaging with them to activate their space and bring people into their space, maybe through a happy hour or a, you know, some other type of event that we can introduce them to the community. And then maybe they won't see this as just an, like, oh, it's so dark, it's so, it's so et cetera. We worked with another bank um, and put out you know, tables and chairs. Uh, outside and provided free outdoor Wi-Fi, so they they became an outdoor working space, um, mm -hmm. and you know they got some customers out of that too. But it was a nice spot; it was a very pleasant spot. We added music to that too sometimes, you know, and 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 it became an activated space. So I think you know, it, depending on where where things are placed, you know, where certain vendor certain uh, tenants mm -hmm. are. I mean, there are options. You know, there are options to work with that. And and frankly, we want we want the whole community to be to be successful, and we need our property owners to be successful. And that includes, you know, the insurance companies and the banks that maybe are a little quieter, but still have a place in our community. Gotcha. It sounds yeah, like one thing you're saying is they actually have to do more to make sure you get the place making benefits. It might not be plug and play, but it is possible. Uh, but you need to have yes. more of an active relationship with that that small business absolutely and i think that you know this is where the bids can show the strength of being a bid and and for that and being an advocate for the community and for the businesses there because we can we can make things happen that you know normally that they might not even think about so i mean we can get them exposure and and help them get more business yep and one thing i'll say for the audience and then go to bobby um you know Tina is with a bid, a business improvement district, but you can get some of these same effects with a merchants association, a chamber, a local chamber of commerce, or even just a group of small business owners who are clustered on the same block who are working in coordination. So 
you may or may not have the full budget team and capacity to have a big structure, but you can get some of these same results just with a little coordination and some volunteerism. So just wanted to put that out there. Um, last, wanted to get to Bobby, and I'm gonna hit you with more of a harder question because we talked about economics and placemaking, but in many places, um, all of us have kind of said something to this effect, which is there is an authenticity to place that you can't get, that has to be thought of, intentional, and is one of the ways that when you go somewhere, you really feel the vibe because you feel like, oh, I'm not just in another place. I could be anywhere right now. Like, no, I am specifically in Mattapan. That's not going to seem like Jamaica Plain and it's not going to seem like Fitchburg. Um, one of the pieces of authenticity does get to um, the demographics and cultural background of the small business owners in that corridor. And so I wanted to talk, um, have you talk a little bit about how small businesses can think about being um, a promoter of equity and how they might help uh, advance you know, goals on equity for cities and neighborhoods. Uh, and how they can bring equity to communities. So I think they inherently do. And, you know, I think we have to really flip the question on its head. You know, you you have to really examine the systems that are at play in order to promote small businesses to actually be able to first, first be able to tenant a space and then to be able to sustain it. You know, a lot of the work that I do is around retail preservation for that Back, you know, like the Small Business Anti-Displacement Network, which I'm on leadership team, we just produced a toolkit um, that's really looking at all the things that, you know, different policies to programs and government officials, nonprofit organizations, et cetera, can really deploy to say, hey, we understand minority businesses are essential and we need to, you know, create ways for them to sustain through gentrification to sustain if population decline is occurring you know thinking about strategies for them to increase their customer base increase their marketability etc um, and this is not you know yes this is a, a factor of them being an integral part of their community i think alana did a fantastic job of you know talking about all of the economic benefits and all of even the social benefits that are associated with it she actually stole a lot of the talking points i was going to answer with this question but um, you know one of the things that is really essential to me it's just really thinking about it from a um a point saying there's real estate cost and you know you know tina they're big you know entering into boston bid is probably a high bar for many of the small businesses you know and then thinking in comparison to you know something that is less walkable and, and less you know doesn't have as much place making because you know those sales opportunities are lower so you know you typically have this rent to sales ratio that small businesses are navigating and so when we're actually thinking about strategies that in place equity you have to start with where can they go um, and so, you know, what, what that has looked like historically is, um, you know, I'll talk about on the slide is like you have some districts that have some older assets. And so those older assets are able to go for a lower rent rate because they aren't, you know, trying to make a performer work for new construction. And so therefore, you, hey, now I'm a small business. I can enter into this market. And if there is a diversified product, meaning some older ones, some younger ones, therefore you're able to really realize this kind of community identity alongside the banks, alongside the, you know, businesses like mine, you know, small business itself. You know, it's like, all right, we can occupy the same district. However, we're all, um, really trying to get to a point of equity for the retailers, um, which you know we patronize on a day-to-day -day basis not being a retailer ourselves and so you know thinking about equity um and from a one step back too is thinking about it as a sense of infrastructure you know if you're in a community and i need you know specific oils i need little clamps to clip my hair like all these things you know in order just to maintain personal grooming you know i can't typically find that in some communities and so i have to go to specific beauty supply stores you know which you know, have 
historically and the black community has been run by Korean American immigrants, but you see, you know, they are um, really answering a specific need. And so, you know, that whole dynamic of being into a community that's answering a need, that's where equity can play a part. And if we're able to do that by those actual community members, providing them the economic the economic answers to do that effectively, then we're really reaching those goals of equity. Hey, how can you continue to provide for your community and communities that you know are within the need um, in order to increase the livability for those residents, the workability for those employees, and then you know the shopability for your store. So thinking about it from all of those perspectives, I think is essential. Oh, you, you made one point that I did want to highlight and just repeat again. Um, the idea that as you're thinking about your retail and you're thinking about your choices and investments in small businesses, thinking about whether those small businesses will ultimately serve the adjacent community. Because sometimes there's lots of retail and other options that are coming to a particular corridor or attempting to come. And it turns out that you know, you basically, one version of gentrification that can be negative is that ultimately all the small businesses in the local area no longer provide services that are applicable to the communities that were there before the community revitalized. So that's one of the sort of push pulls of thinking of, well, how can we make sure that there are some community serving businesses and not just retail or small businesses that are really just beneficial to the new people, but also to the folks that have been around for years as, as investment has you know, waited to come to an area. So I think that's a yep. super important point and a, a framing of equity you don't hear as much. So thank you for yep. that. Yeah, and I'll add one actually thing to that is also thinking about what tools are in place to help those businesses like transition to widen their customer base you know it's like hey we can continue to serve those legacy rest re residents are there tools that one can either lower how much the rent escalates or other costs that are associated with gentrifying communities such as taxes things that you know are oftentimes externalities and not direct uh, indicators but also thinking about hey we're technical assistance providers and other nonprofit organizations that can support those businesses and saying hey you thought about changing your packaging up you know doing you know we all know facade improvement programs they they're hit or miss depending on who's able to take advantage of them. There's equity issues in that in itself. Um, but thinking about it um, in general is just really, you know, they, there needs to be conversations and there need to be strategic advancements towards those goals. Thank you, Bobby. And that, that provides a good bridge to a question I have for Alana um, that might even have a presentation that follows. Um, and, you know, Bobby, you talked about technical assistance, facade programs. Tina talked about working directly with the small business and having conversations and helping them think through how to be a better placemaking, um, um, you know, asset to the community. And it all sounds like a lot of work. Um, and in many cases, I would say, and, you know, folks in the chat who are attending here could weigh in too, you're in a place, you're a city official, you're a local person working on these issues and big business comes to town. So Walmart or a big retailer and the like, and they're like, you know what? You don't need to provide us any technical assistance. We have our own facades. You don't need to help us grow our business or how to scale or service the new clients and the legacy clients. We have all of this already. We're plug and play. All we need you to do is subsidize us or just give us the land and we'll go do what we do. Um, so the question I have for you, Alana, is there is some pressures often to support big business and not small business, because in some ways, folks think it's they're easier to deal with, and there's pressures to say, well, I can bring more jobs to my communities with big businesses. I can have less sort of outputs that I need in terms of dealing with the businesses, and they fail more often if they're smaller. So what would you say to folks who say, hey, maybe I should just focus on big employers, get these big wins, more jobs. Um, how would you describe why they should really should focus on small businesses instead? 
Well, thank you for that great tee up for this presentation. Um, so, you know, I, I frame it all a lot, a little bit about disaster proofing, but but thinking about it the way Calvin has framed it. Um, next slide. We're we're gonna we're gonna you're gonna hear me say next slide a lot because uh, I can't control it, but we're all good. Um, I think when when we think about whether we should be investing in small business, it can't be an either or. It has to be an all of the above. And it's a question of dedicating staff and resources to small businesses and not just big business. Because the reality is there's a lot of communities, a lot of local and regional economic development authorities that see that their job is only recruitment and marketing. It's not even a there's too many things, we're doing too many things kind of question. I'm sure they're doing a lot of things, but it's to the detriment of the small business community, in fact. And the reality is, is that these small businesses create the personalities of our places, which is what draws people to that place. Next slide, please. And it creates this opportunity to display what is wonderful and what is unique about the place. Next slide, please. Um, but we also know that this is a part of what neglects, shows the neglect of our places, um, that not every place has received the same benefits as each other, that there are places where the economy has bombed out, um, bottomed out, um, where pop certain populations have been excluded from opportunity historically. Next slide, please. And that we really need to think about how we use this unique moment to change because there is so much that's going on. We have the American Rescue Plan funds out there. There are other grant funds that are there, um, but we can use this as a very, very unique moment in time to make some significant changes for our small business community. Next slide, please. Um, and that it really is this transformational moment that we are in. Next slide. When we talk, when I talk about these kinds of businesses, I do focus predominantly on small scale manufacturing. And, and there's a reason why. Um, when we're thinking about uh, anti-displacement and really wanting to not only help locally owned businesses be a part of the rising tide of the community and help build wealth for the people who are in that community now, like what Bobby was talking about, um, or when we're talking about the the bid and, and what Tina is doing and, and really creating this place where, where people are out and about and being a part of the community, small scale manufacturing sort of are this hidden gem that, that pieces this together. Um, this is CEO Ceramics, they're based in DC. I met the owner at a local uh, street festival. Lots of vendors, lots of people, everybody masked. It was lovely. Um, and of course, the, I focus on small scale manufacturing, so I go and talk to these people all the time. Um, and found out that CEO Ceramics was at the festival, but also has a storefront, which you can see here. And they have a micro retail storefront space. Um, this is a new development, a development that was built in the last 15 years, so it's relatively new. Um, and it has a ground floor space that's the non-prime retail frontage that the developer in negotiation with the city committed to creating these micro retail spaces for artisans um, and committed to a below market rate for 30 years as part of their the art artist district negotiations at a community benefit uh, commitment. These spaces are really incubating local small product businesses. One of the reasons that this is my obsession is because of what this business can do. This business owner can be at a street festival and selling in that space. This business owner can be um, in their storefront producing their good in that space, doing production and retail in that storefront. This business also sells online direct to consumer as well as wholesale to other storefronts. So all of a sudden this business has four different forms of revenue coming into their store, which makes them much more resilient if one piece or another gets weak, if the storefront needs to close, or if online sales go down, or one or the other. This diversity of, of uh, product and of, of ways of bringing in revenue make it a much stronger business than something that might be what we would consider traditional retail that's only selling out of the storefront. Next slide, please. But we can also look at folks that are not doing retail, but might in the future. This is uh, Woodhaven Custom Calls. They're based out of Heflin, Alabama. This is a tiny town of 5,000 people with a three block Main Street. Um, lovely people. Turkey Calls. Um, it's for turkey hunting. For anybody who doesn't know, um, when I was first learning about it, I referred to them as turkey whistles. I recommend you not do that when you talk to people about these because they'll laugh at you like they did me. But this is a great business because it's two blocks off of Main Street. It employs a few dozen people. Um, they produce their goods there. They uh, sell it online, direct to consumer and wholesale. 
but they became so popular over the pandemic with so many people out and doing outdoor activities that people started stopping into their place of production and saying, can we tour your production space? And so now they're thinking about creating a small retail frontage with glass windows into their production space because they know they can be a draw for their community and really help bring people together. Next slide, please. We also have shared spaces. Um, this is mess hall, it's a commercial shared kitchen. A commercial shared kitchen might be something that you're familiar with. This is really help where we, where we help grow product businesses. So when we think about small businesses in our community, I really think about that pipeline of growth. We do this automatically now for tech businesses, right? Just to be clear, we have incubators, we have mentors, we have shared spaces like co-work spaces, um, we have investments that go into tech, all because we think we're going to have that one unicorn, which very few places actually get. We can create the exact same thing in product businesses, the shared spaces, um, the mentors, the growing retail space, and the investment vehicles, to, because some of them will scale unicorn, very few like tech. Um, we have Under Armour, right? That's a, a perfect example of that. But And some of them are gonna be honest tea, right? There'll be a food product business that scales. Some of them are gonna scale to 20 employees or 10 employees of good paying jobs in our community that will never leave because they are homegrown businesses. And so commercial shared kitchens with food products lower the barrier of entry so that you don't have to have the investment to build out your own commercial kitchen. You can uh, rent it for the hour or the day. Next slide, please. We also have these great models of shared buildings, multi-tenant buildings for small product businesses. This is one in Philadelphia called Macon Studios, um, where it, the, each piece of this older industrial building, like our old textile and mill towns, but they've been, uh, they've, these have been reused for product businesses to create safe and affordable space for product businesses. The developer is a for-profit developer, um, but they see that there is a high demand for these spaces um, and that they can be competitive in this location. So next slide. If we think about where this all comes together, it's really about cultivating the strong and resilient storefronts with disaster-proof businesses from an economic standpoint. Next slide, please. And that is all about investing in this very purposeful and intentional way to say not only about filling spaces, but how do we make sure that the way we're filling spaces is a public good, is benefiting the community, not only in the short term, but in the long term as well. Next slide, please. And that we're thinking about this in a way that addresses racial inequities and place inequities, inequities because we know that historically we have excluded certain populations and we have excluded certain places from benefiting from this. Um, the, our history of excluding black business owners and black households from owning property uh, is a pretty intense legacy that we are all coming out of um, and that the economic development and planning fields um, have made a lot of purposeful decisions in the past that really created these exclusions. And then when we look at smaller towns and mill towns that have lost um, businesses, large businesses over time, and haven't received the support to really turn around and, and be able to have an economy that does something different, um, we know we can see some of these purposeful actions of the past and how we have to really change the way we do that going forward. So going forward, next slide. If we look at small scale manufacturing, there's a way to invest in the people who live in your community, these places where people can come together and the structure around them. And one of the things that's important to think about is what we can do now, what we can act on now, what we can implement now in the next six to nine months that make a difference for these businesses right now in our communities and then think for the long term. Next slide. Small scale manufacturing is a, is a really sort of a hidden economic engine. There are people who make things in your community, no matter the size of your community. I've worked across the board. Next slide. And they create these benefits where we can invest in the businesses that are in community and help more of our households build well. Next slide. And then we can also help build a more inclusive opportunity within our community that is building that wealth. Next slide. And also do all of this while we're filling our storefronts, while we're filling vacant spaces in our community with businesses that are selling in person and online. Next slide. And by filling these storefronts, we're also starting to address vacant properties. We know that vacant properties on a block bring down property values by 20%. Filling those vacancies is a huge solution to addressing some of our challenges of, of these cycles of loss and exclusion um, and doing it using some of the, the policies and programs that Bobby 
um, was talking about earlier and that I highly recommend going to find the Anti-Displacement Network website. Um, the toolkit that Bobby mentioned is phenomenal um, and I'm recommending it to all my, my wonky friends. Um, is, is a really important way to think about ha having space for locally owned businesses as a public good and worthy of investment just like we invest in affordable housing because we need to retain the ability for our local households to build wealth um, and to have good paying jobs in our community. Next slide. And then when we take care of our own businesses, word gets out and that's one of the best forms of business development and attraction is by showing people, not telling people that we are in fact taking care of our own small businesses. So next slide. We are in this unique opportunity, which is access to the American Rescue Plan money, this recognition right now that downtown is vital. We all saw it, everyone celebrated being able to come out into the streets. It's almost hard to remember what last year was like. I think our memories try to put it away, um, but that, that that recognition helps attract more entrepreneurs and build more entrepreneurship within our community. And this broad recognition that if our small businesses fail, we all fail. So what does it mean to make it happen? Next slide. Um, it's really about making things happen and taking action. Next slide. You can just go through them slowly. Um, it's really about um, making places where people want to come together. Next slide. Um, and really creating these places where we can have action. So here's five actions. One, create affordable space for the diversity of small businesses in your downtown. That might mean creating micro retail space. That might be subdividing a 10,000 square foot space into 1,000 square foot spaces. Property owners might need support in doing that, but the retail market has changed so drastically, we need to invest in this, and that we can do it purposefully through partnerships that help us bring the diversity of our community into those storefronts. Next slide. The other thing we can do is really fill in the gaps in our assistance. That's assistance in multiple languages, that's new partnerships, um, with faith organizations, neighborhood leaders, cultural groups to share information outside of our bubble. Most cities and economic development departments sort of live in a bubble and we need to break out of the bubble, break out of the office and build these new partnerships to get the resources out. We do not want to be the best kept secret um, and really figure out how we are supporting existing businesses, existing product businesses from my standpoint to help them not only be more resilient, strengthen their revenue that they're bringing in, but scale and grow and hire in our community as well. Next slide. The other thing we can do is create these targeted investment models. Um, amazing to see what people are doing with their revolving loan fund programs from the USEDA, CDFIs that are out there that are, that are really making a difference, micro grant programs, um, particularly focused at black and brown business owners um, to help start addressing inequities. And some CDFIs that are very specifically um, focused on black, Latino, and other business owners of color um, to make sure that they are getting the benefit of business loans that in fact that they were excluded from in the past. Next slide. The other thing we can do is look at our policies um, within the community and really figure out how we can uh, change local policies. Next slide. Uh, and really figure out how that makes a difference in our zoning um, and in our uh, permitting to make sure that it's really easy for businesses to move into those spaces. And then the, the last point is, thank you, onto five, um, is about community pride. What are we doing to bring people together? Um, there's a great study that was done years ago called Soul of the Community of Why People Are Tied to a Place. And it's three factors. They feel included, there are places to gather, and there's some aesthetic beauty of that place. Um, you have old buildings, you have a great place, um, you can, absolutely renovate them to be a part of it. But even before you're looking at big real estate investments, having outdoor events, holiday markets, ways to bring people together and celebrate are a big piece of this. And these pop-up markets are the pipeline of your small business growth. The people who are product vendors at this can be your future storefront users and really cultivating that community of vendors to become your storefront users down the road is a big part of that. Next slide, which I think might be the last. Um, if you ever want more details about this, uh, as Doug said, I wrote a book on this. It's called Recast Your City, How to Save Your Downtown with Small Scale Manufacturing. And it's a DIY book. It is how you do it with worksheets and everything. So I hope this is a good kickoff for you. Alana, that was awesome. And I want to bring in our fellow panelists uh, and just ask for your reactions. Um, to anything and everything that Alana said. Um, rip it to shreds if you can, um, or just let's have an amen chord over it. Either way, let's let's have a dynamic discussion. So any particular thoughts um, that come to mind, 
Uh, we'll start with you, Bobby. All righty. <laughs> uh, well, two things. I am finally getting a chance to read Alana's book uh, <laughs> while I'm on vacation, and it's been a great, easily digestible book. Uh, but two, um, is I, I think that, you know, really understanding what small businesses do in terms of equitable wealth. Um, it's, I think what you know, Alana really um, showcased and thinking about strategies and tools to actually get us there. Um, and so thinking, you know, where that sh different shared kitchen models to investing in you know, um, downsizing actual storefront sizes to something that's much more market appropriate today. Um, and even, you know, thinking about it from a you know, different community typology lens, you know, one of the things we urbanists often <laughs> perpetuate is understanding like, oh, walkable downtowns and, and things. But I think, you know, we have to also have the reality that, you know, some communities are home to strip centers and, and things that are much more vehicularly oriented. But those are also places and spaces for small businesses to um, tenant and thrive. You know, you'll see common tenants of you know, nail salons and barbershops within those um, strip centers, you know, whether, uh, as well as food and beverage um, opportunities. And those things, those tenants are definitely um, worth uh, investing in as well and thinking in, in those places and thinking about strategies really to, you know, create a place that mirrors, you know, that downtown, you know, why would a customer want to stay here a little bit longer with their family and thinking about it from that way. Thanks, Tina. Any reactions, thoughts? Yes, uh, it, it's. I mean, I totally agree with you know everything Alana and Bobby have have, have said. On um, it does make me think, though, you know that this the support uh, for these small businesses needs to be universal. I mean, you can't. You have to have government on board. You have to have landlords on board, willing to you know, in some ways make sacrifices or tax incentives, tax credits, something that is going to incentivize landlords to support small businesses. I'm looking at in my district, which is already well established. I mean, when you're looking at retail rents that are anywhere from 50 to 80, 90, $100 a square foot, they need some kind of uh, incentive to help out these, these uh, you know, the small businesses, startups, uh, you know, et cetera. I mean, that's we we've been fortunate that um, I think the and the market has has uh, forced in some ways this to happen as well because if retail has suffered, um, but in my district, the traditional retail of you know shopping you know, or buying clothes, et cetera, has been replaced with experiential retail. So now we have uh, places for people to go to enjoy making art, to uh, experience wine tasting, to uh, have play a game, you know, do team building exercises. We have another place where you could bowl, you know, we have bowling and, and all these other things going on. So it's it's been, it's been changed out, but it does require experimentation too. And the government and and the landlords need to be you know on the same page for doing that. I love that. Um, I love that Alana focuses on uh, the small you know the manufacturing end of it. We we have it as well uh, in in my district where Union Kitchen is an incubator you know accelerator for food you know food manufacturing businesses, and so we're able to help them test those out in our farmers market. We've also done the reverse where we've had vendors from our farmer's market grow into storefront businesses. Um, but again, it required the landlord to, you know, give them a little bit of a break to get started um, in, as, as a storefront. And, you know, if, if, as long as we're all on the same page and, and they're willing to, to do that, then it's, it will be very successful. Yeah, I love, you can almost call this the retailer journey, right? Where it starts at a farmer's market, maybe it starts in their basement, um, and then it leads to ultimately a storefront on an a important commercial corridor. And part of the goal needs to be thinking about that journey, where your businesses are on that journey and where you can provide support. Um, we got a very interesting question from the audience that I want to ask that then will bridge into my next question, which will be to Bobby with a little presentation. But I thought the question was so interesting, I wanted to start with it. Um, they asked about inclusionary zoning. And I think part of the context here is 
a lot of the things that you each of you have said require kind of ongoing follow-up and follow-through and the same vision to get to the same results. And one of the things that inclusionary zoning policies do is they make it not just a function of whether the politicians today or the, elect, the officials working in government today believe the thing, that the rules require it. And so, Bobby, I wanted to start with you, but anybody else, and then we'll then move to Bobby. Are you familiar with any inclusionary zoning policies that talk about small business as opposed to just housing? So I will give a long answer to this question. Um, first, uh, when you examine inclusionary zoning and um, the tools that are used for housing, you recognize that many of the tools are intended to um, assist in the capital stack. So intended to fill the gap that's affordable housing and, and the you know limited return that it provides comparative to market rate. Um, when you examine that on the commercial lens, you don't have those same set of tools, at least not at the federal and most state levels. Um, so you haven't necessarily seen any commercial inclusionary zoning tools being able to be deployed. When you think about that from a you know future policy lens, you, know, you have seen a few of cities and um, places who have created specific subsidies to come in um, and fill that gap you know in dc they have programs that provide you know million dollars to developers if they are providing um lower rent for space space that's you know it with um let's say food products you know spaces in certain wards etc and so you start to look at those as potentials for getting there. However, the paired with the, the zoning practice of inclusionary zoning, as well as the funding tools, in most places I have not found one that, you know, have worked and that people have many times attempted. I've had several, you know, projects I've worked on and we're like, all right, can we make this work? Can we make this work? All right, government, you know, county government in, in many instances or local government, how are you willing to be that gap filler? Um, and so that's a long answer to no, I have not found one that's been very soluble. Anybody else? Uh, Tina, you look like you were about to jump in maybe. Uh, I, I, I was wondering what Bobby was going to say because I haven't seen it either. I mean, we're very, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, you know, where we are, my district, are, it's extremely successful. So it's really, again, dependent on the landlord and how much they want to support. I've had landlords give crazy incentives for a restaurant to come in that, would, that they knew was going to be successful and help them draw office tenants in. So, I mean, it's really, it's become in my district, it's very, very specific to the building to that location, to what's in that building already, and like what do they need to attract and fill up that building? So, yeah, it's very, you know, it's I, I, I'm, I was very, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's almost disappointing to hear what Bobby says, but it is, it's very market driven for us. Mm -hmm. Alana, you were gonna say? San Francisco has one policy that I think would be great to replicate. So San Francisco is not in their commercial zone; it's actually in their industrial zone. They recognize that they don't have enough industrial space in the city and they wanted to create more small industrial space in the city and so they added an overlay to their production re uh pdr production PDR. distribution um their pdr zone their industrial zone their urban industrial zone um and they added an overlay to some sections of it in the city that said this is more or less a vacant property that is industrial it's, it's a vacant piece of ground it's not a vacant vertical property we will allow you to build office on this space as long as you also build x amount of new industrial multi-floor new industrial and you have to bring in a third party partner who's going to not only manage that um, but also report back to the city annually how many businesses are in there how many jobs are in there so it's giving them a way to start recording information about what's going on there um, and that has made a real difference uh, in a lot of spaces. San Francisco also has a, a zone that's for small business enterprise. It says 
um, in this area, your X percent of your ground floor or all of your ground floor has to be um, spaces that are 2,500 square feet or less. Acknowledging that um, if you put, make the footprint smaller, you're at least more have more potential of a local business being or a small business being able to lease that space. So those are those are two policies that I think are really strong. There are legacy, uh, you know, discounts or or funds that are available to folks. Um, and then I think there's also a real role for cities and community development corporations um, or land trusts, which is in the anti-displacement um, toolkit that Bobby helped create. Um, but to really think about um, long-term ownership of properties to help preserve affordable space for locally owned businesses. Um, and the last thing I would say it builds on what Tina said, really smart property owners understand that having cool ground floor uses is a competitive edge for their upstairs. Doesn't mean it's for their apartments, it's for their office, whatever it is. And so by bringing in, and there's a huge developer in DC that has figured this out, right? Edens does so much cool stuff in their properties because that is creating the brand. Um, Pure, Pure 70 in San Francisco is also doing this as creating their brand. So really thinking about it, not so much as like, how much is that property owner willing to give up? But if you do something on your cool, on your ground floor that's bringing in less revenue, you might actually bring in a lot more funding, a lot more revenue from your upstairs because you've created that cool factor. So there's that part of it as well. Yep, Bobby, you were gonna, you, you had a burning thought too. Oh man. <laughs> so I, I was like, okay, yeah, I answered the question, but I have there are other tools, right? And a lot of started to get to those things, right? You can, you know, address uh affordability with overlay zones. You can address them with um, you know, various stipulations that one require smaller spaces um for businesses, you know, whether that is narrowing the actual limit for total um, you know, uh square footage of, of that retail bay all the way to actually the facade width and so you know in Arle in Alexandria they have a, a code for uh it's for one of their commercial districts that limit all neighborhood services um to a neighborhood district they have a 25 foot limit and so you can you know start to examine those things as well as think about it from a, a code perspective where you know any building this i actually wrote a recommendation for montgomery county about this where any storefront um, or business that is above a certain uh square footage they have to occupy a below ground or second floor space but have still have ground floor space for their entrance and so you see that specifically in urban districts right and you want that to occur you know say hey i have a walmart so you know in dc that's walmart on h in i forget like over there by new jersey um and thinking about that day you come into the space you go upstairs into the walmart um however below that there's many other um, businesses that are occupying mostly you know food and beverage and you see that same kind of instance occur elsewhere and so when you start to manipulate tools um, that we do have at our disposal without necessarily requiring the financial support you can get to the outcomes however you know having a, a mandate for a certain rent rate it that is where you really hit the slippery slope in the retail market because leases aren't as standardized you know which is another you know challenge which i'm going to talk a little bit about um in tenant protections and and even occupancy if they aren't standardized up front you can't necessarily have you know these uh, CIZ type requirements because you're like, all right, well, I'm offering, you know, one tenant a $35 a square foot lease rate, but I gave them $300 uh, in tenant improvement allowance. And then I'm offering another tenant, you know, a, a $25 square, you know, square foot um, lease rate, but I only gave them a hundred or $75 a square foot. And so, you know, it starts to, you know, play out within, you know, how the landlord is actually capturing the revenue on the back end and how that really dictates what type of space that they're able to provide on the front. No, that's that's important. One thing, one other version of this, which I think we've alluded to, but I just wanted to drill down is if if a city controls land that where there's going to be redevelopment, including commercial space, 
This is where you can create a race to the top and ask the developers to tell you what kind of small businesses are they going to include in their redevelopment proposal, potentially what subsidies they may or may not need, and make it part of the competition and, and an evaluation criteria of the competition of what, they, what their small business strategy is. So then you have the potential developer fighting for the, the rights to win the redevelop the property and thinking about small business and retail and their support of it as part of their proposal. And so even if you can't do inclusionary zoning for political or legal reasons, um, you can start to get to these issues in property you control and make it part of what people have to respond um, to RFPs um, with ideas on. Um, and, and that's just another strategy. So um, this is good. Um, Bobby, do you feel like in your presentation, you still have more to give uh, on these government policy issues? I knew you'd say yes. Um, so let's switch to you and we'll, we'll let you take the, take the mic. All righty. Um, yeah, there's, I couldn't even, there's like 10 to 15 minutes talk about how do you support small business. I was like, wow, that's probably like five hours worth of content um, at the minimum. But <laughs> I'm going to see if I can like dive into it. So next slide. Um, so what are you looking for? Um, so we're going to start with, you know, different zoning things that, you know, most of this presentation isn't really emergent, right? A lot of it is all right, what has been proven historically to work? So next slide, please. Let's first start about talking about parking. Um, we all know parking is required and you know they are in some districts more so than others. Um, however, you know, when we're thinking about it, we actually need to understand actually the implications it have to the small business environment. When there's a mandate and many parking minimums, you end up with scenarios where um, there are excess parking spaces and then the cost of actually developing that parking those parking spaces are passed on to the tenants um, and that's through rents that's through common area maintenance etc um, and so thinking about uh, parking strategically in a way that you know we been businesses specifically small businesses can benefit from shared parking agreements from minimum like more so maximum parking um, thinking about where does um, pick up and drop off occur for you know more modern um, practices such as uber eats and in doordash etc as well as delivery you know we see in lot within small businesses that they're pivoting to understand all right this omni channel or how do you sell their same good or services both in store and online and maybe some other kind of medium such as a food truck or others and so you know having all of that integrated within this space is something to keep in mind next slide this is Bad Saint. Uh, Bad Saint is a restaurant in DC. It's uh, 24 seats. It was ranked the number one restaurant. I think that was like 2017 or 18 in the United States. It's 24 seats. Think about that within your specific zoning codes. Many communities have restaurant seat requ number requirements and so you know say hey you have to have 50 or more seats to be a restaurant or 100 you know thinking that in itself creates this inability for you know these emerging businesses who might not be able to afford that much space that can only just push out a really good product and only have 24 seats because hey all of those additional fixtures cost so much more if i need to build out a kitchen to feed more than those that many people, you know, that's going to cost more. All of these things are really additive. And so um, understanding, you know, how, you know, the minimums in terms of the interior space actually um, limit the opportunities for those small businesses as well. Next slide. Um, flexibility. And this is flexibility within use. 
Um, I also want to talk a little bit about flexibility in space, but we're going to start with flexibility in use. Um, so we see across the U.S., across the world, really, um, these bike shops are also cafes because, hey, who don't need to fix their bike tire and send the email and grab some coffee um, on the way to work, specifically within more urban environments? You know, this may look like something else in your community. This may look like... Uh, you know, a candle maker and a, a restaurant, you know, how do you have that full olfactory experience during um, a dining uh, excursion? So thinking about, you know, these things, you really want the businesses to be able to create as many verticals as they can in order to sustain specifically in scenarios where they're at great risk, such as a COVID, you know, hey, we no longer have as many people biking in our community. So we're now just going to be pushing out coffee as much as possible. What does that mean? Okay, we're going to you know can this coffee up or provide cups on the sidewalk, um, provide other pickup and drop off. You know, reallocate space internally. All of those things. So creating that opportunity within the code um, to allow for um, businesses to actually share that space and do so in a safe way, of course. Next slide. Additionally, we all know the flexibility of interior space as alana mentioned is a is a priority however we have been left in many communities with large big boxes that are vacant and we're like what are we going to do with all this space no small tenant can come in and subdivide these you know 30 40 50 foot ceilings um with you know really expansive column grids into something that really is demise for their business um they don't have the proper entrances you know all of these things thinking about these design standards that are associated with larger scale developments is something that you should also think about all right what happens retroactively? What happens at the end of that business's life cycle? Can we repurpose this business, this building? Is there a community use, you know, that could go into these brick and these larger big box spaces, potentially, but that's few and far between, specifically not for the property owner to realize the rents that are required in order to sustain those spaces. Um, and you see time and time again how, you know, there's been uh, you know various false promises by some you know, brands to enter into a market and they actually don't and that is, ends up causing you know other brands to actually exit because they're like oh i can't sustain competition with a target or a walmart etc so i'm going to close my grocery store and then if, if that doesn't occur you know now we're left with these two types of gaps right it's like you have this demand that is unmet now because you know the previous tenant that was fulfilling it is no longer there but you also have the supply gap where you're, you know, have this either build out space or vacant land that was promised for this specific business that no longer can occupy it. So think really strategically about how we occupy, how we activate space. Next slide, please. Um, I talked a little bit about this previously, but the mix of older legacy spaces, such as in Silver Spring, this is um, uh, some historic spaces on just Georgia Avenue that are built like in the 60s. There's some new construction, multifamily in the, you know, in the non-retail prominent corridor and thinking about how we actually provide, you know, some new construction space alongside some um, historic assets in order to provide easier entries into the marketplace. Next slide. Next, going to look a little bit at municipal code outside of zoning. Uh, next. Um, so I was recently involved in a project in DC studying the district's nightlife. Um, and one of the major findings was around DRAM Act or who's responsible for intoxicated persons. Um, so those are laws that you know are associated and assigned to businesses. Prior to me, if I, I did not have the time to actually look up what Massachusetts are, but things that we recognize was that, hey, the business in DC is actually responsible for intoxicated persons um, inside and outside of their facility. And if you know a, something occurs, they have the liability for it. So what does that do? That increases the um, insurance costs for that business. And you know, in comparison in DC to Maryland and 
Virginia, you understand that, oh, DC is the only place that has this. The insurance providers in the region don't really understand it. They're charging them a premium because they don't really understand it. You know, therefore you have these negative externalities that really inhibit, you know, one new establishments opening, but also older establishments from preserving themselves specifically in time strained um, years such as the last two um, that we've existed through COVID and really thinking about, all right, what is what's worth, you know, this experience and how we businesses need to kind of navigate these things. So at the state level, you know, really understand liquor licensing laws and, and really moving that um, forward. Next slide. Um, and we all understand that, you know, community voice is needed, um, but sometimes you have this outlier, you know, I, I saw this picture, I was like, everybody else don't seem like they're really into what she's saying. Um, and so I was like, you know, there's been so many times where you have this, you know, one voice that um, is over many others that ends up changing the um, tone for a community, something that's not as democratic as it may seem on the front end, but, you know, thinking about what does that mean for businesses? And, you know, sometimes there could be proponents or opponents to that business establishing within the community, specifically small businesses that may be seen as a nuisance. So those that sell alcohol, you know, there that um, play music, you know, that live music specifically, etc. And so creating a democratic process for those businesses to actually, you know, be approved um, and be able to, uh, you know, open and start their leases on time and create revenue in ways that don't hinder them from, you know, starting in the red automatically and what they have not um, pre-planned for because of, you know, one voice that may be not Rep that may not be representative of the whole. Um, there's also ways on conversely to think about it. All right, how do we actually incorporate community voice within tenanting? You know, there's opportunities, as Calvin said, around um, community owned land and you know, government owned land and how that you know, can be transitioned over and how the community can actually have a voice within that. But we have to understand the dynamics of retail and dynamics of the market that it's not easy to say, hey, we identified this business five years ago when we you know, submitted our plan. Now they're, you know, either they've had much success and they're no longer looking at a community typology like ours, or, you know, they are looking, you know, they have failed and now we need to backfill with a different type of business. So keeping engagement as a, a constant part of the development process before retail, specifically when it's land that, you know, you have some type of agency on. Next slide. And then thinking about um, bar alcohol to, to seat to restaurant sales ratios. That's another thing that some communities deal with, where they're like, all right, restaurants have to have 50% food um, sales ratios. I said alcohol to restaurant, it was alcohol to food um, sales ratios. And, and so that 50% must be um, food. And if, you know, alcohol goes over to 51, there's issues. And so thinking about what does that mean for a business when alcohol is the most profitable line item for a retailer, specifically, you know, food and beverage establishments, and how can we create this kind of buzz, but also thinking about it as a way to create energy. Because, you know, when, when you see people inside um, sitting at a bar and those types of establishments, it, it typically is a little bit more vibrant than all the, the, the seats, you know, being, um, you know, in, within larger chairs, you know, within traditional dining room format. Next slide. And then thinking about building blocks of success. So what else is needed? Um, next slide. Place management, we talked about that a little bit, you know, Tina's here, so I'm not gonna spend much time. Yeah, you know, we've seen what Times Square has and how all of the, you know, people and the entertainment and the public spaces all integrate in a way that, you know, creates this buzz. There's opportunities to do that at very at many scales from very rural communities, the strip centers as mentioned, um, to those as active as Times Square. Next slide. Uh, also need patient capital. Um, and what does that look like? You know, patient capital uh, for retail is not 
common. Um, and so that means, you know, capital that is that enables businesses rent rates to grow at a pace um, that they're able to sustain long term, you know, thinking about strategies for businesses to really uh, be able to continue to occupy earlier on in the development. And so, you know, hey, I'm it, with new construction, if my loan needs to amortize over a seven to 10 year period as required by most um, commercial loans, how do we actually provide you know, time for, all right, can this, this product, this you know, new um, retail space enter um, the market a little bit below you know, what is market rate so that we can um, you know, attract a small business. If it's unable to do so, we end up in these scenarios where, you know, all right, there's national brands and banks and stuff that are occupying these spaces. Um, but if there's patient capital, there's the return is not needed as immediate as, you know, in traditional financing, there could be um, greater opportunities for small businesses themselves. Next slide. Um, highlighting this, this is Motor City Match um, because there's also need for you know various other supports, you know, community development block grants. So Motor City Match is a program that leverages CDBG funds in order to support um, small businesses occupying initially within the um, city. And so what does that look like? And that is um, them providing several programs. Um, so that's from having their business plan to designing their space constructing that space etc um, and providing funding opportunities for them to do so as well as for connecting them with other um, organizations that can support that growth next slide and next looking at um, what i alluded to earlier, which was their specific needs for commercial tenant rights. Um, you know, we historically have protected uh, residential, um, residential tenants. And so, you know, those tenants, obviously, because you need a, a safe place to dwell. But, you know, what we've learned through most of the research that we've been doing on the commercial side is that actually in most jurisdictions, there are no commercial tenant rights and so that's what's the what's the condition of the space what type of space um, is provided parking access what you know how can a landlord in it terminate the lease and what what are the requirements for that landlord all of those are independent and individual contracts that are drawn up between the landlord and tenant and so thinking about strategies to put preserve and promote small business really has to come on a contractual side. And if we're, you know, being as strong of advocates for these commercial small businesses as we are the residents that um, occupy the communities, we can end up with some many more equitable outcomes, specifically in areas that are gentrifying where new landlords or um, are coming in. So, you know, property transfer from one landlord to another, et cetera. Next slide. And then thinking about overlays. I'm not gonna mention that because we already talked about it. Next slide. I think I'm already out of time. I'm so sorry. And it takes a team, five slides. You can just go through them immediately. <laughs> All right. Slide one, uh, entrepreneurial support organizations, uh, banks, so that's community development financial institutions. Next slide. Oops. One more slide. Academic institutions, those academic institutions are not only for supports finance, like with like educational and thought leadership, but they also could be technical assistance providers. Thinking about tapping into them for different capstones to support, hey, we need to redesign this business with a design school, um, or we need to look at their operations and accounting with the business program, et cetera. So thinking about how you can um, leverage those institutions for free or reduced rate support. Next slide. And then historic preservation and what does that development look like? Um, next slide. That's it. Thank you, Bobby. Um, wanted to do a quick kind of speed round and bring back Alana and Tina yet again. And 
just any quick reactions to uh, Bobby's presentation, including wondering where you got all the great pictures. But um, yeah, Alana, any uh, you you've probably seen parts of this presentation before. Any initial thoughts, and then Tina. I took notes. I knew it was coming this time. Um, I think there's two things that really stand out to me among many things from Bobby's great presentation. One is really thinking ahead about retrofitting these large spaces. They're not just the big back stores at the edge of town. They're the big boxes that we've built in the middle of town because we did, as much as I've been a proponent of mixed use for my entire career, we spread peanut butter like, we spread retail like peanut butter. Um, so it's everywhere. Um, and so we really have to think about what is that life of that space? Um, and I think that that's a great point. Um, the other piece that really stands out to me always is about this community engagement. Um, hosting a public meeting is not community engagement anymore. <laughs> um, one of the things that we saw from COVID, uh, I call it COVID land meetings. Um, what we, one of the things we saw during the pandemic was that when we in fact moved our community meetings online, we had a much more diverse community of people engage. Um, we removed the barrier to entry um, but even that to me isn't enough. And so one of the things that we always talk to communities about doing is about going out of the office and going and doing one-on-one um, -on -one interviews with business owners who we want to target for assistance. If we know we want them to benefit from our work, let's make sure we understand what they need and having small group discussions um, with different people. Um, we know that the barrier to entry to public meetings is really, really high. Um, and so that meeting people where they are at their kid's school um, at their community center is going to be a really important part of this. Um, there's a lot of really loud and angry voices that try to overtake conversations. Um, and I think we have to be incredibly purposeful about saying, fine, you're going to be loud, but you're going to be one voice out of all of these others. Um, and I think most communities don't invest enough time or energy in that. So I just wanted to put an extra pin on that one. Tina, do you have any loud voices strategies you want to share? <laughs> well, I, I I love that Bobby and Alana both mentioned that. I mean, the, the the silent majority is well overlooked. You know, on those those people are working, they have children. You know, so these community meetings that are at inconvenient times are not you're not listening to the silent majority. Um, and it tends that we we have a, we laugh. You know, even in Arlington and even where I I do live in Old Town Alexandria, there's five people that show up to these meetings <laughs> and are very vocal and obviously very wealthy because they can, they can hire attorneys and everything to stop anything that they don't like. And um, just, for the, just for a very quick example, we had an, I would say, upscale, very posh adult uh, uh, store, you know, adult toy store um, that was, you know, being very, very moderate and not, put, not putting themselves out there they decided, you know, these people decided to attack that store and make this a big point. Well, um, another property owner down the down the way said, you know what, I'm going to show you. And they opened up one that was pretty trashy. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> it's uh, so I like that. Those five voices, they, they some, you know, it's sometimes you have to say, you know, just we hear you like like Alana said, we hear you. But the rest of these people, you know, we the majority feels differently. It's very hard to make that stand. Yeah. Well, I wanted to shift gears a little bit and thank you everybody for that um, segment. Um, one of the other things, speaking of COVID land, Alana, is the, the advent of just severe challenges in cities and communities when it comes to their kind of office areas, their downtown office districts and the like, um, anywhere where kind of office is clustered a lot of them have just gotten crushed. And um, Tina, if you could speak to both your kind of experience as a bid, but also even if a place doesn't have a bid, what are the types of things that um, folks can do um, as city officials or quasi-government folks to kind of help small businesses sort of deal with the losses that are probably continue to happen due to the continuing nature of the pandemic? Like what have you guys done and what could folks do to try to support while kind of the office areas are still taking these significant hits? Yes, well, we're, again, I, you know, I'm very fortunate in my district uh, that we are a very well-rounded, diverse uh, community. 
where we have a 50-50 mix of residents, residential and commercial properties. Um, I think one of the lessons learned here is that, you know, it's 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 vital to have a, a mixed use, very amenity rich community. Um, and as I said before, you know, because we, we do have that in my district, we, we did not, I mean, our streets were always full of people. I mean, it's, we did not have this dead zone happening. Um, I think that the, you know, the office you're, you're, we're already seeing, we pre pre COVID, we were seeing, um, office conversions to, uh, apartments. My district started that trend over 10 years ago, um, where we started to see conversions into apartments. Um, and it's, and, and, and in our case, it's, it's a very good thing because it supports the retail and the, to a much higher degree, um, supported more retail and more small businesses, um, to occur. So, um, now we're seeing, you know, this happening in the, in the, in the bigger downtowns as well. Um, it's, we, I think we're going to see more, you know, more migration to, you know, lower tax districts, you know, in, here in the, in the South, pro probably Texas, Austin, Dallas is uh, becoming very um, attractive for that. However, there are political considerations there. Um, and, and at the very least, you know, some, maybe some driving some of the office uh, tenants to the suburbs or splitting offices between downtown and the suburbs as well. Um, I think to compete, you know, um, their offices need to, you know, building owners, property owners need to up their amenities. Uh, again, we've, we've had this race for luxury um, in residential and apartments, and now it's, it's, become, it's becoming more and more important for office properties to have those A++ uh, space, you know, whether it's wellness solutions in place, uh, quiet rooms, meditation rooms, uh, technology has got to be top notch. Um, it's got to be very de desirable for people to, you know, have, uh, you know, to have that high, you know, very high speed technology, you know, internet, et cetera. Um, I see, you know, we've had this line between, we've, we've had a blurred line where work has always interrupted our lives. Um, and now we're going to, I think the line going back is going to be blurred as well. I mean, uh, not only have we had much more casual office environment, I think you're gonna. We need to have more integration of having our our, our small children, in, you know, at our office. Our dogs. I've been saying this for ten years that you know more of these office spaces need to be dog friendly. Um, I was dog friendly twenty years ago. It's helped me with retention of employees and etc. I think that's something that really really needs to happen. But I don't think office is dead at all because uh, I think it's just going to continue to change and evolve. I mean, there's too much. There's too much. Uh, uh, it's too much necessary to have that that collision uh, event happening with uh, employees and mentoring young talent um, to happen. So I think we will continue again to see more conversion to multifamily. But the the but again to the point about small businesses and you know restaurant retail all those storefronts it's absolutely necessary you know to to that to you know, maintain that vitality of downtown and. I, 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 unlike my my other uh, two panelists here, I did not include uh, you know a million slides of, of beautiful pictures, which I'm very grateful that they did because I kept very uh, very uh, very um, straight up with uh, just some content here about what we did during the the pandemic. So what we learned, you know, as far as like the need for flexibility, the need for a bid. I mean, we uh, we the bid was able we were able to you know, respond very quickly and and alter our programming to to fit the the environment of which we were operating in. Um, so it's and what we what we did find though was since we already had a great um, I would say you know our business environment was very friendly. We knew we, but we, we did have to make it even more friendly. Um, and we just we did come together as a community to do that. Uh, the partners the partnership between the government, you know, the Arlington County government, Arlington County Economic Development, uh, the chamber, the bids, um, and then the the rest of there are nonprofits and charitable organizations within the community. We all worked together um, to support our small businesses um, and of course those people in need um, in, in our community. So um, just to give you some examples of what we did, um, go to the, the, the next slide please. And 
So our COVID countermeasures, uh, you know, small business operations, assistance and investments. So actual um, services, which I'll go into and, and, and in direct investment dollars um, to help out our small businesses. Um, even more business friendly environment. We've always touted ourselves in, in especially Virginia as being number one for, for business. Arlington being very business friendly as well. Well, we have to be even more so. What we what we discovered is there are we 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 can do a lot better. Um, and then marketing and promotion were absolutely key. And I this is where the bids were absolutely critical to to working with and helping our small businesses, in particular our retailers and our restaurants, uh, survive. So you can go to the next slide, please. So talking about direct assistance. Um, we already in Virginia and in Arlington provide expert advice and guidance, but we upped it even more during, during the pandemic. And as resources were made available by the federal government and by the state um, to help our, our businesses navigate all of that, like which, what do I qualify for? Is it an EIDL loan? Is it the PPP money? we provided experts and assistance to uh, to help them navigate that help them fill out the forms what do they need etc uh, in order to do that um so that was absolutely critical to our businesses virginia um as i said was it's already been number one for business um they the economic development partnership and fbdc up to their game as well but they had they had already had this infrastructure in place to support and help small businesses start up, grow, expand, et cetera. Um, Arlington County has an amazing program, um, and I know a lot of uh, communities also have their own small business development centers. But we have a program called Biz Launch that's absolutely stunning. Um, the it's a multilingual um so we have a in, in spanish in particular but there is all there is you know 90 other languages spoken in arlington so there is a multitude of of resources available in in so many different languages to uh to help out our small business um owners whether they're trying to start up or trying to navigate the county's processes for permitting inspecting etc so that that in fiscal year 2020 alone, Biz Launch helped over 8,600 clients, um, and they offer almost 120 workshops and seminars. That's just even pre-COVID doing that. They also the county uh, uh, introduced relaunch. So as we were um, coming out of COVID, um, or as we were uh, things were starting to change, the businesses that that were affected. They, they went ahead and made direct investments in helping uh, businesses get an online presence. So they have, um, they've invested in actually creating, they gave resources and money to create websites for businesses that maybe didn't have one or needed a new one or needed a new face, you know, integrating the, you know, OEM and uh, social media, et cetera, and then teaching them, you know, how to navigate those those that that whole new area they have if they weren't familiar with it so giving them an online presence to alana's point about having another revenue stream so that's just huge you know going forward for them as well and then the bids in the chamber we you know again and we were we were the um the the collector of all of the resources so if you go to went to any of our bid websites or the arlington chamber website the multitude of all the resources, all of the funds that were available, whether it was in a um, federal, state, or local funds, we, everything was listed in one-stop shops. You know, so if you were in Boston, you could go to our website, and then we would, you know, it, it connect you to where you needed to go. Um, but, but essentially, as I said, the county took on a great role in helping these companies navigate all of these resources and and figure out where what to apply for as far as getting that advice and then direct investment. So, and to that point, um, the direct investment, Virginia alone like, put out over $140 million um, to small businesses throughout Virginia. And they did focus on those areas that were um, you know, harder hit. So um, over 3,500 3, small businesses received that $140 million. And now just uh, in August, they've um, authorized another 250 million which is focused on um, low income communities, uh, minority owned businesses, um, another fund that they have, they have other funds that are geographically focused as well. Um, called, one is called SOAR, the Southern Opportunity and Resilience Fund. So these are, you know, 
uh, you know, targeted for, you know, certain um, areas of, of Virginia that are maybe less, less fortunate. I mean, the, here in Northern Virginia, you know, we have so many resources and, you know, our economies, you know, I, while it suffered, it did not, it, it was, you know, it, it's bounced, you know, we, we bounce back so much faster than the rest of Virginia. So um, those uh, funds are there. Right now they have this return to earn program trying, you know, to help incentivize, you know, hot rehiring and having people come back to work. Um, $500 for each new hire, that's a direct, you know, cash, you know, payment uh, for any of your new hires. Um, and, and we know how difficult it is right now to to attract talent to hire people. Um, but it's just money to help again with you know marketing that, promoting that. Maybe that's an incentive that goes right directly to the new employee. Um, so uh, you know so many so many resources here. Arlington County. Um, this is a terrible acronym because the grant is the acronym. And I just love, I love government when they come up with these new things. It's called giving resiliency assets near term. That's grant. So they um, came up with, um, uh, you know, about $2 million in the first tranche of money, 2.8 million um, with, with also we as bids contributed direct funds to, uh, to that, into that 2.8 million as well. So there's three bids Arlington that all contributed uh, uh, cash into that fund. That's the first time we've ever done that. So uh, we have never uh, given you know money directly to a business. But this was also done. You know the county did um, take you know take the lead on you know accepting the applications and then determining who you know which which actual businesses would get would would receive the grants. And they were ten thousand dollars up to ten thousand dollars each. Um, Three hundred ninety three grants were made. Um, and now uh, they've just authorized another $2 million. So that's where the 4.8 is coming from. So another tranche of money is going to be going out. We, as I said, contributed funds, but we also marketed the heck out of it. I mean, uh, you know, getting the word out to businesses that these funds are available and it's all of the resources that were available. The bids played a huge role and, uh, in making sure that it was marketed, social media, signage, you know, yard signs. Uh, we went business to business. Um, and to make sure that they, they, that our businesses knew that they had, they had us as a resource and that there, there were funds available for them. So, um, you know, we actually did the, did the, you know, going door to door, storefront to storefront to make sure that, um, our businesses were aware, um, that they, they could apply for these funds. Uh, so next slide, please. And then, um, creating the, you know, continuing and augmenting that business friendly environment environment we you know everyone says they're business friendly or they they try to tout that we we had to bring it to another level we have a, a business ombudsman i mean essentially any business and and our and the bids contact the business ombuds do you have a problem are you having a problem with permitting inspecting you know there's you know there's issues with uh, your outdoor space that you're not able to 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 use it or you don't understand this is the person that you just call this person. I mean, this is the person that's going to solve the problem. And they solve the problem. And that is I think, one of the biggest complaints you get from, from business owners is, we don't, you know, how do we call? What do we do? Well, if you don't know, you should start with the bids, you know, and we'll help you connect you to this person if we can't get you to the right person in the county. Or if the problem is too big for us to help or solve with, we will, we will engage this person. And it works. Um, so I would highly encourage you know, other districts to do that, have that person that, that people know they can call. I mean, that's the most important thing is being able to respond, right? So also flexible signage and zoning regulations. We've been working on this as a bid for years. I mean, as long as I've been at the bid, there, we've had issues with signing, issue, issues with zoning, especially with the changing face of the retail environment. Being flexible is just, I, it's, it's, it's it's just I I can't express how important that is and these zoning regulations put so much you know constraint on on space and what the use could be. We actually uh, worked with the county to um, allow uh, up to for up to 365 days to to put in a different use into our retail spaces. Maybe it wasn't zoned for, but we're gonna try. I'll say well we wanted to do a co-working space. I said, let's just set up a co-working space. So we finally got the county to say, yes, you can do that. Now they're looking for, for more flexibility. 
I have operators that want to open up a doggy daycare. I have operators that want to do um, fulfillment centers or micro fulfillment centers. And unfortunately, they're zoned industrial, light industrial. And now we are coming up against these zoning you know, issues. But the county is working on this now to relieve that, that pressure because, A, we've got empty space that needs to be filled and we want great operators and these are services that are that our community is demanding so um that's that's what we're we're working on that right now as well the, um, the lifting of the alcohol sales restrictions for takeaway orders was huge for our restaurants um so virginia did that and then the county had to as uh, to accept that as well so that was huge um for for them and i just i just <laughs> remember seeing people you know Go go for especially the um, our uh, our couple of Mexican restaurants uh, that were like the margaritas the, the to go margaritas was just it was just hilarious because people would be like I just want to get my margarita <laughs> tonight you know it was like so so every day you'd see like some of the same people like taken away but it was it was a great way to help support the restaurants during this time that they couldn't have people in the in their restaurant. Um, so pop-ups were an, are another you know thing that we do quite often um, in, in first floor retail space that's not being occupied right now attract people to the space i mean we have we have work that we're doing with our universities marymount and george mason and virginia tech to kind of bring their innovations and creativity to the street level um and that's that's some, that's one of, we're working on something quite big right now hopefully that will come to fruition in the next year but really get people excited about the creativity that's occurring behind the walls, behind the office, you know, in the office where you might not see it. Um, we, of course, like every other district established, you know, an expanded outdoor restaurant retail space. Uh, this was like in, in the beginning, it was kind of a, it was kind of a push and pull with the, with the county. They knew that this was critical, you know, to happen. And they, but in my opinion, it wasn't happening fast enough. And, they were, you know, initially they were like, well, well, we need a plan. And then we were like, no, 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 no. This, this should be like back of the envelope thing. I'm going to draw what I want for the outdoor space. Let's worry about this later. You know, let's get them the space, let them get their furniture out there. Let's let them, you know, you know, have get, get, get back to business as quickly as possible because they're not, people aren't allowed inside, but they can eat outside. They've got to get the space. So taking over sidewalk space, taking over uh, street, you know, the part of the street, the parking spaces in the street, um, that was really uh, absolutely critical. It still is um, because we, again, we just don't know what's going to happen. Um, we had some restaurants have their best, their best summers ever, their best fall, their best summer their ever with the additional outdoor space. So not only were they saved, they thrived in that environment, being able to use um, more outdoor space. And then parklets, um, again, pickup drop-offs are were critical. We've um, there are now 119 locations around Arlington, um, and many of those are now being made permanent because they work. They work great, and it's 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 great for the for the restaurant or retail, or even it's we it doesn't it don't have to be a restaurant to to put in for a pickup drop-off space. Um, and so many of those are going to be now made, be made permanent. Um, our parklets, you know, again creating uh you know uh, an environment that's you know ex you know vibrant exciting you know you know beautiful um was really important so areas where we you know we noticed we noted a lack of you know greenery or just you know p places for people to sit you know you put in a parklet put in some type of you know amenity for them as well and then easing the permitting and inspection processes again that was you know related to the outdoor space but also getting new businesses who were who were planning to start pre-COVID, helping them get into that space, making it easier for them, you know, as far as much as possible to get through the process, hold their hand through the process. We have the online online permitting um, and inspection processes that that occur, you know, making sure that that system online was is, is seamless, is flawless. Um, that still has work to be done, but it's so much better than where it was. And helping them get into their space as quickly as possible saves them money. Uh, so that's really that was really really very important to us, and it's still happening. So um, very key. And then the last slide, as far as you know, marketing and um, promotion, uh, absolutely. You know, this is where the the bids just completely shine, and this is what we do. We created Boston Cares. Um, this whole 
program around helping businesses uh, get the word out that they are providing an environment that's clean, that's safe. You know, we had not only uh, tools for them, the flyers that they could put up in their storefront. We branded masks uh, for them. We branded blankets for the restaurants. So the people were outdoors at, in the in the winter time, the, the fall and the winter. They we, they had a, a branded balsam blanket, and they would and it took a selfie and then put that out on social media. Again, helping the restaurant, helping people know that Balsam still in business. So come out and support the restaurant. Excuse me. <clears throat> So um, again, doing, um, excuse me, I'm sorry, my, my throat's hurt. <laughs> we did restaurant specials. We hosted a restaurant worker relief fund. We had uh, programming, we pivoted our programming. We engaged our social media influencers, which expanded our reach exponentially. And then of course, continued to activate our outdoor spaces. We ran the farmer's market. We had that back up as soon as possible. <clears throat> And then had music throughout uh, the, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. Let me just, one second. All right, excuse me. Got some kind of frog in my throat. <laughs> so, so music throughout the, um, we had music on, um, on a tractor trailer bed going around the community so people can enjoy themselves. So this is where the bids really shine. And um, and continued to host a whole you know a whole plethora of uh, COVID safe events during the during the whole pandemic, and still we're continuing to do that. So, so that's what I have, Calvin. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Tina. It's amazing to see when you're so excited about what you're talking about that you get choked up in the middle of the presentation. Yeah, I love it. Um, let me bring back Alana and Bobby for just a speed round um, of any uh, immediate reactions to what Tina said. Uh, I did want to note for the audience that there's so many tools, so little time. So um, one of the things that SGA is going to think about is like where, how can we sort of disseminate some of these resources that have been mentioned, or even even some of the places where, as an example inclusionary zoning policies that relate to small businesses, they still seem few and far between and maybe doing some research there. But just wanted to see Alana or Bobby, did you have any uh, media reactions that, um, to what was said? Bobby, you want to go ahead? Sure, I, I mean, I, first I just want to applaud Tina for all the hard work. <laughs> I, mean, I just know, you know, like supporting as many businesses that are in her district. Um, it in doing so in very strategic and effective way. Um, so I think that's my number one. And number two, I would definitely say, you know, thinking about, you know, things big and small, I think really it's all about sales, right? For the my, many of the, the small businesses, it's like, you know, how can we produce the sales for them to continue to operate, for them to support their families, to support the communities um, that they serve, et cetera. And so, you know, whether that's through marketing, through specific you know programming for the businesses that you know support the businesses the district etc all of the things that tina mentioned i think we are really large proponents of that hi can you hear me yes something did funny things on my computer um so I'll just add one more thing. Um, I think it's great as an improvement district um, to really see yourself as that in between, between the small businesses and the local government. And I think that we're seeing more and more of that happen in improvement districts or major organizations um, that having the, uh, you know, having a regional ombudsman um, looking at things like the rezoning, but particularly having things like the business de business development support happening in the neighborhood, so that you're not only socializing the neighborhood, but you're helping the people who want to be there. I think is is just a, a great role for an improvement district um, or any location specific authority to consider. So, this is a great list. Awesome. I did see that uh, there's a comment from the audience that the great city of Somerville, Mass, in which I used to live once upon a time. Um, does have an inclusionary zoning um, provision that does talk about small businesses. So there are examples in Massachusetts, um, and there's probably examples elsewhere that we really should compile and disseminate for all to understand. Um, any kind of closing remarks? We're gonna hand this over to Doug Landry in just a moment, but any final thoughts based on everything you heard or 
anything we didn't cover that you wanted to make sure that uh, the audience knew about or wanted to consider? And actually, why don't I go around the horn and just give each of you a minute or two. I'm going to start with Alana. So the, the one thing I would I would ask people to walk away from all of this with is to think about a balance. What does it mean in terms of local leadership to be supporting different parts of our local economy, um, not just the parts that we've always supported, but really thinking about how do we support small businesses in new ways? How do we support a diversity of business owners? And what does it mean through all of these different tools that we've shared with you today to go out and really understand specifically in your own community what those needs are? Because the more that we can get out and talk to the business owners in our community, small scale manufacturing or any other kind, talk to them specifically about what works for them, what's challenging for them, what do they really need in the next year for their business resilience and growth, the more we can invest in programs um, and space that is almost de-risked because we know there's a demand for it. And we so rarely seem to do that in economic development, um, but I would really encourage people to sort of break out of the, of the fold and, and, and do more work like that. Um, and then be able to know that there is a need for any one of these kinds of tools that we've shared with you. So good luck. Awesome. I'll go Tina and then Bobby, you'll land the plane for us. Tina. Uh, I just have to wanted to stress the the need for partnerships and that it's you know it really is important for the entire community with the the you know the the government the economic development chamber the and the bid I mean I think this really I think you know what we've seen is that the communities that have bids you know do just do better I mean like we there is a there's that constant advocate you know the that's you know, we're we're the we're grassroots. We're on the we're there. We're talking to the business people every day. We're advocating, supporting them. So I think you know, it's it just it goes to, to show that then the bids that play a critical role. It's becoming uh, almost ne necessary to have a bid or some type of partnership, some type of entity that is that is looking after businesses in the community. Sounds like we should do a study that compares the. Um, vacancy rate and other metrics of districts with bids versus others during COVID and kind of use that as one metric to consider the value of having a, a focused organization who can provide the type of services um, and passion you bring, Tina. Um, so finally, Bobby, land the plane for us. Final thoughts. <laughs> Um, so one, I will say that uh, I'm going to share with you a study that we completed on on that topic. Um, it was very prevalent in business improvement district that they had greater success rates at um, EDL and PPP loans. Um, so with mm -hmm. that, um, I want to also talk a little bit about, I think my big thought is just data. Um, you know, there's... Data takes time, but data is very important. Um, I think each of you within your communities have a opportunity right now to really understand who the businesses are and what their needs are. Um, you, leveraging, you know, grant programs, leveraging your um, time, connecting them with various resources to really detail that need set but also think about it in a way of data in terms of what the market can support um, you know we've been we're all proponents of small businesses but we understand that there is only a limit you know you can't put retail everywhere you can't put small manufacturing everywhere you can't put office space everywhere um, but you know you really need to understand what is the appropriate mix for that and then push your strategies toward that appropriate mix and figuring out how whether or not hey one category is over attended over retailed in another or you know are there opportunities for growth in something that you wouldn't even um uh dream of initially and so you're leveraging really data for those conversations and really creating a, a environment where businesses can thrive through that love it data 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 well, I just wanted to say thank you to my panelists, Tina, Alana, Bobby. This was awesome. Had a lot of fun. Um, and wanted to hand it over to our quarterback, Doug, to for some final remarks and thoughts. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Calvin, awesome job. Everybody, thank you so much. Um, I'm just looking back at the last two sessions, and I... Uh, the quality of the discussion and just the thoughtfulness of all of this has been really impressive, and I hope that everybody 
again, you know, has who signed up, you know, t uh, tuned in and are going to at least see the recordings of this. Um, and I'll have to just plug Locust because this is the kind of quality of discussion uh, that I got used to that kind of got me into this this whole organization. Uh, to begin with. So I'd highly recommend if you're thinking about uh, joining a, 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 an organization, take a look at Locust because this is the kind of quality stuff that we deliver. Um, you know, all of the strategies I've heard here and bringing it to Massachusetts. Um, first of all, I love this perspective from, you know, outside of Massachusetts. We are, uh, we're a very, uh, you know, um, insular place sometimes and it's, it's an echo chamber sometimes. And some of the strategies we hear from the outside you know, I see them, they're incubated and nurtured in different places around the state. If you go to Turner's Falls and see, you know, some of the maker uh, kinds of economy and kind of small businesses that are out there or or in Hudson and the kind of the transformation of Hudson downtown. I live in Natick. And if you talk about, you know, uh, supporting small businesses, not necessarily in a, in a downtown area, but even in, we have a place called Lookout Farm, which is the, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an apple orchard that they've, converted into a cidery and outdoor restaurant experience because uh, they had to do something during COVID and they were going to go out of business and they had to work with the town to get outdoor dining licensed for alcohol and et cetera. So um, if you go there today, it is unbelievably successful. So these kinds of strategies we're doing in Massachusetts, um, I would just say everybody on this call you know, I'm sure you'd raise your hand and be a resource to anybody who's listening in, you know, for further ideas. And I would also say the community of planners and the community of economic development professionals in this state who know the places I'm talking about, uh, we have a community to do this stuff. So support each other, you know, and, and take best best practices and, and put them in, into, into play. So awesome job, everybody. Um, some things for, um, Housekeeping, uh, yes, there will be a recording of this available. Uh, Calvin, you mentioned uh, some resource guides coming out um, that are going to summarize each of these each of these sessions. So I, I know that Smart Growth America is going to be working on that and make these available uh, to to the attendees. That's great. There is a survey to to fill out, so please make sure you do that. And then the next session, it just gets better and better. Next session is going to be November third, Wednesday, at 10 a.m. And this is going to be a session on planning for the future of transit and TOD in Commonwealth communities. And again, we've got a, a great, a great panel there uh, locally, Heather Hume from the MBTA, but George Leventhal uh, and one of Calvin's uh, compatriots down in Washington, D.C., Jair Lynch, actually is going to be part of that panel talking about TOD. Um, and that's a big topic here in Massachusetts, particularly with some of the zoning reforms that got passed last year and encouraging dense walkable development around a transit node. So thank you, everybody. Great job, um, and we'll see you at the next session, okay? Thanks.